Hello and welcome to BioSlogos, the channel where biology is explained by handmade illustrations. Substances necessary for growth and development plants take up from air and soil. The leaves absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and incorporate it through photosynthesis into organic compounds, which make up about 96% of the plant's dry weight. In addition to carbon dioxide, photosynthesis also requires water, which plants absorb from the soil through their roots. To build some organic compounds, plants need additional elements, so-called minerals, which are found in the soil in ionic form, so the root absorbs them together with water. For example, in order for a plant to make DNA, proteins, the high energy ATP molecule, as well as many plant hormones and coenzymes, plants need nitrogen, which is absorbed by root system in the form of nitrates. Furthermore, for the production of chlorophyll, the main pigment of the absorption of light during photosynthesis, in addition to nitrogen, plants also need magnesium. For the production of nucleic acids, phospholipids, which are basic building components of cell membranes, as well as the already mentioned ATP molecules, plants need phosphorus, which they absorb in the form of phosphates. Plants would not be able to absorb these minerals without consuming energy, which they obtain from a high energy compound known as adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. This compound is formed during the process of cellular respiration in the mitochondria, during which organic matter is broken down with the help of oxygen. This means that without oxygen, the absorption of minerals from the soil is not possible. Although the plant produces large amounts of oxygen during photosynthesis, almost all of it is released from the leaves into the atmosphere. So for the purposes of cellular respiration, the plant takes most of the oxygen through the roots. Over the next few minutes, see how the root absorbs water and minerals from the soil and transfer them to the conducting vessels in the plant stem. The root of the plants is extremely branched, which significantly increases the surface area for absorption. If we make a cross-section of the root, we can see epidermal cells on the root surface, most of which have a root hairs, structures that further increase the root area. Beneath these cells, there are cells that build the root cortex, which is separated from the central cylinder by the layer of endodermal cells. The central cylinder consists of two types of transport tissues. The xylem, which transports water and minerals from the roots to the leaves, and the phloem, which transports mostly organic matter through the plant. The first barrier to water and the cell minerals on the way to the xylem is the cell membrane of epidermal cells. This membrane is cellitically permeable, which means that it regulates which minerals will enter the cell of the epidermis and in what quantity. After selection, water and the cell minerals easily pass from cell to cell of the root cortex and eventually to the cells of the xylem elements thanks to plasmodesmata, tiny channels through the cell walls that connect the cytoplasm of neighboring cells. To explain how the plasma membrane of epidermal cells absorb water and dissolve minerals, it is necessary to understand the basic properties of water molecule. Generally speaking, solvent properties of water are explained by the polarity of its molecules. When we look at the structure of this molecule, we can see that the oxygen atom is connected with two hydrogen atoms by covalent bonds. Atoms form a covalent bond by sharing a common electron pair. As the oxygen atom in this molecule has a higher electronegativity than hydrogen, it attracts these two electron pairs more strongly to its nucleus. This results in the part of the molecule where the oxygen atom is located being partially negatively charged, while the part of the molecule where the hydrogen atoms are located is partially positively charged. Because of this distribution of charge, we say that water is a polar molecule. When water molecules are close enough to each other, there is an attraction between the positive pole of one molecule 
and the negative pull of the other. This force of attraction is called the hydrogen bond. This type of attraction is also possible between water and other polar molecules, such as glucose or amino acids, but also between water and charged substances, such as cations and anions. The image shows an example of dissolving sodium chloride, or table salt, which is in the form of crystal lens. In contact with water, the salt dissociates into sodium cation and chloride anion, so that oxygen atoms from water molecules as negative poles attract sodium cations, and on the other side, hydrogen atoms as positive poles of water molecules attract chloride anions. The conclusion that follows is that all polar and charged particles are soluble in water, or we can say that they are hydrophilic, and in the water solution they are solids. Soil minerals are in the ionic form, so nitrogen is in the form of nitrate anion, phosphorus in the form of phosphate, but there are also cations of potassium, sodium and other minerals. A water solution with a higher concentration of solutes is called hypertonic solution, while on with a lower concentration is called hypotonic. There is a third possibility when the concentration of solutes is same in two solutions, in which case they are called isotonic solutions. The movement of water through the semi-permeable membrane of root cells explained by osmosis. It's the process by which water molecules move through a semi-permeable membrane from a hypotonic to a hypertonic environment, or in other words, from a region of low concentration of salt to a region of their high concentration. This image shows a root epidermal cell that is hypertonic in relation to the soil that surrounds it, so that water enters the cell by osmosis. The question that arises is why in this direction? If we enlarge the part of the epidermal cell membrane where the osmosis takes place, we can see that the plasma membrane is semi-permeable, which means that water can pass through it, but not the ionic minerals dissolved in it. The illustration shows potassium ions, which attract water molecules and form hydrogen bonds with them. In this way, the bound water molecules become inaccessible for transport across the membrane. The more solutes there are in water solution, the more water molecules are bound to them and therefore they are unable to move through the membrane. On the left side of the membrane, that is, outside the cell, there is a smaller number of potassium ions, more precisely only two. On the right side, that is, in the cell, there are four ions of potassium, which means twice as much, which makes the inside of the cell hypertonic in relation to the outside. The number of water molecules is the same on both sides, to be more precise, 17 on both sides. However, there are nine free water molecules on the left side of the membrane and only one on the right, because the others are bound to potassium ions. According to the physical law of diffusion, free water molecules will move from a space of higher concentration to a space of a lower that is from a space with less dissolved substances, which we call a hypotonic environment, to a space with a higher concentration of these substances, which we call a hypertonic environment. In our case, the direction of movement of water molecules, that is, the direction of osmosis, will be from the left to the right side of the membrane, that is, water will enter the cell. By entering, Water molecules will reduce the difference in the concentration of these molecules on opposite sides of the membrane, and according to diffusion, they will strive to equalize them. This mustn't happen in the root cells, because in that case, this osmosis would stop. That is, the plant would be left without water, which would surely result in its death. To prevent this from happening, the root cells actively pump minerals from the soil into the cell interior, and thus maintain the hypertonicity of the internal environment. This type of transport is called active and requires energy consumption in the form of ATP, because minerals are transported against the concentration gradient, that is, from the area of their lower concentration to the area of their higher concentration. 
the energy of the ATP molecules is spent on changing the shape of the transport membrane protein, which results in the transport of the mineral ion across the membrane. We can conclude that without the energy obtained from the ATP molecule, there is no active transport of minerals into the root cells, nor the achievement of hypertonicity prerequisites for the entry of water by osmosis. As mentioned earlier, ATP can be made during the cellular respiration in mitochondria only if oxygen is available in the root cells. Therefore, it is very useful for the plant that the soil surrounding the root system is loose and well aerated. The active transport of mineral ions into the root cells is accompanied by the entry of water by osmosis, which results in the creation of root pressure in the xylem which is sufficient to rise the water to a certain level in the stem. However, this pressure is not enough to rise the water with minerals to the leaves, where they are primarily necessary for photosynthesis, but also for other physiological processes in the plant. This problem is especially pronounced in plants that are several tens or hundreds of meters high, when the movement of water towards the leaves is opposed by a strong force of gravity which tends to return water to the root. In the next video find out how plants overcome this problem and how the smooth flow of water from the roots to the leaves is enabled. Thank you so much for watching and if you enjoyed this video and found value in it, don't forget to like and share it. I appreciate that. If you are new to the channel, consider subscribing for more content like this. See you soon.